wanted to start with uh, what you did before Blizzard. Like, w what did you do before you worked at Blizzard, and how did you end up working there? Interesting. Um, the quick answer is before Blizzard, um, I was working uh, on the loading dock at a local JC Penney's. Um, you know, drawing, you know, orcs and dragons uh, on the back of shipping manifests. Uh, so, you know, I, I wasn't uh, headed in a, in a uh, professional creative vector um, uh, very quickly at all. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up in Southern California, and unless you happen to particularly know people in Hollywood or in the comics industry, um, you know, it was close to impossible um, that you would ever, you know, get a chance to work as a, a professional artist or anything like that. So I got very, very lucky. Um, uh, at, at, at one point, I was actually in a band um, uh, around uh, is back in the early 90s. And uh, I guess at one of the gigs, I was drawing on a on a napkin, you know, like a dragon or something. And this guy walked by and went, whoa, hey, that's pretty good. I know this place um, that's hiring artists. Um, and I didn't even know what the place was. Um, and I got, you know, I had I had drawn and you know, kind of written stories um, since I was a little kid. And I got all my stuff together, you know, kind of my portfolio. And I drove down to Newport Beach um, where this little company was located. And I walked in and it became evident very quickly that it was a small video game company. And I never, ever imagined, um, you know, that I'd do video games for you know, that anyone even would remotely pay me to be creative. And uh, they hired me on the spot. You know, I put all my, my portfolio out, and it was really just was hand-drawn, you know, um, illustration images. I'm, I didn't know anything about computers or computer graphics. It was a very different world back then. Um, but I put all my stuff across the boss's desk, and he said, all right, kid, you know, um, are you in or are you out? I said, man, I'll, I'll sweep your floors, you know, okay. just, just to be close to um, – you know, other people that were like me, you know, um, you know, geeks that were digging it out, um, you know, and um, just to be part of that creative world um, was just something I never dreamed I'd get to do. Uh, so I, I jumped at the chance and, uh, you know, it's, God, I've been doing this, it's about uh, 20, over 21 years. <laughs> Crazy. That's awesome. So um, you you didn't go to college, you just drew as a hobby? I was I, it totally is a hobby. Um, you know, as, as I when I was a little kid, I would kind of draw my own comic books, and you know, I was a big, you know, I was just a huge geek, right? Uh, you know, comics were my first love, and I loved them all, right? Marvel, DC, I, I loved the big worlds um, and all the characters and how they related. Um, and then a little later, I got into Dungeons and Dragons, um, Dragonlance in particular, and just I love these giant worlds. So I was always drawing and um, running um, my, you know, the, the D and D campaign I did with my friends. And just building worlds, you know, we built worlds of our own, and um, so I had, you know, mountains of, of drawings and stories and things like that that I had been working on, um, just, you know, in my own time. You know, it's it's it, um, it's all I thought about. It's all I did. Um, you know, so that connection point of getting to do it professionally one day was definitely a, a distant pipe dream. Um, you know, the industry was very different back then. Like I said, you know, unless you knew people in Hollywood or you knew people, you know, the comics industry was in New York. And for the most part, you know, video games, there was some, you know, some in Southern California, but that's really, that's Japan, right? You know, back then it was all Nintendo and Sony. And so, you know, the idea of getting, you know, professional work that way um, just seemed you know, impossible, you know, for, you know, for, for who I was and where I was living. So trip out, you know, that, you know, the industry was just starting to kind of bloom uh, at that time. Um, so, you know, kind of very lucky, you know. Okay. Very cool. Um, so when you first started at Blizzard, uh, I know from the looking for group documentary that you said that uh, they kind of saw what you were writing and then they asked you to do that. So, uh, you you were an artist. Were you like a, a concept artist or? Right. They uh, when I got hired, it, it's so funny, right? They hired me to be an animator, and oh, I had wow. never I had never animated anything in my life, right? You know, I could right. I could draw, you know, at least relative to back then, you know, industry standard back then. Um, and he's like, yeah, you'll come on and be an animator. Um, he was really just taking a chance that I just, was just this kid with a lot of passion and a lot of imagination. And he's like, well, hell, I can I can teach you to do the things I want you to do, but you can't just teach instinct, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
and I think he took a gamble on me. And you know, sure, I, I learned. Um, I think the animation programs we were using back then were um, like a deluxe animator, and you know, like really simplistic programs where you're you're kind of drawing with pixels and moving frame by frame. Um, I was working on uh, Justice League Task Force, which was a, like a fighter game based on the Justice League, and uh, I animated a lot of. Uh, oh no, I did uh, some tile sets for like Lost Vikings 2. Um, uh, what was the other game? Um, Death and Return of Superman. I did some animation, so it was really it was really crude stuff uh, back yeah. in the day, um, but. At, after about the first year, so I was animating and having fun, but I, I really wanted to make stuff up. I really wanted to tell story, and story was still kind of nebulous for video games back then. Um, you know, it, it, no one really reached too deep uh, for video games. So we're doing Lost Vikings, right? So as long as you have a plausible plot, no one's really thinking too deeply about, you know, motivation and, you know, characterization. But I came from this fandom of like D and D, right? These deep, deep worlds of mythology and good and evil, and you know, civilization on the brink, and that's really the stuff I wanted to chase. Um, and at the time, it's funny, two things happened: the industry started to become more uh, 3D, like the artwork you know generated in video games was now it's suddenly it's um, you know, uh, God, what was the program? 3DS Max. Um, you know, different programs start to pop where all the sprites in the video games now are rendered through an engine. Mm -hmm. And I tried that for a while, and, and I'm a little more right brain than left brain, and I, I hated it, right? It was just, it felt like doing math. You know, I'm like, ugh, I just hated doing the animation. So I'm like, wow, I, what, what, what happens here? Am I still going to have a job in six months if I can't, you know, learn how to do this well? And at the same time, um, we dropped the first Warcraft game. And, you know, it's almost at the same time as the Internet's blowing up. So Warcraft 1 comes out, and you can play with your friends. And, it, you know, it kind of was this little quiet little hit. Mm -hmm. And at the time that they're talking about doing the sequel, Warcraft 2, um, I stood up and went, all right, screw this. You know, like, here's what I can do for you. So I stayed late one night, and I wrote up, like, a one page of plot, you know, that might have – that would bridge the events of Warcraft 1 to a potential sequel – and I didn't show it to anybody. I think one of the other designers um, actually showed it to the boss, unbeknownst to me. And the boss is like, "Whoa, dude! You know, you, you know, you're all right. You know, you're not you're not Shakespeare, but you know, you've got some ability." Um, and he offered me an opportunity to kind of um, kind of be like a writer slash designer on Warcraft Two, and that's really where um, I kind of activated. You know, um, I got my first chance to write anything on on War Two, and I. You know, I I crafted a really big world out of it. You know, Warcraft One was a kind of a small little conflict, so I made up this giant world and all these races and factions, and you know, kind of did the same thing I had been doing when I was a kid. Um, but suddenly, hell, it's going to get published. You know, it's, it was just an awesome time, and that really allowed me to show the company what I could do. Um, you know, kind of between doing concept art and writing scripts and really just ideating. Um, on this world um, really was how I wanted to spend my time, you know. Sure. Awesome. Am, I, am I talking too much, dude? Or? No, this, this is great. <laughs> as long as you have time to talk, I'm willing to listen. <laughs> um, were there any sacrifices you had to make in order to do what you do? Sacrifices, interesting. Um, let me think about that. Strangely, uh, well, one thing was I was actually um, I was I was taking classes part time at the time, like the first year I was at Blizzard. Um, I was going to Cal State Fullerton, um, and really I had no major. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, honestly, I was just kind of sleepwalking through it. I wasn't a very focused student, you know, because at night, you know, I was doing the the band thing, and you know, then I would kind of draw <laughs> and draw maps and characters, uh, you know, in the middle of lectures. So. I wasn't going anywhere fast, um, but when I got this job, and it was, you know, a number of cities away, you know, it was like a 40-minute drive from where I was living at the time, I kind of had to make a decision, you know, am I going to double down on school, um, you know, um, for some kind of degree, or am I going to roll the dice and, you know, jump into this thing, Um that was kind of uncertain, and I remember, you know, my dad was just going, "Dude, what are you, what are you doing? You know, school is everything. You got to have your degree. You got to go, go, go." And I'm like, "I don't know, man. You know, I, there's something, there's something about this." Um, and I, I was fortunate enough that time and tide, you know, kind of proofed that it was a good decision. 
um, I wouldn't. I, 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 I'm a big, especially at this, you know, 20 years in. I'm a, I'm a big believer in school and training, mm-hmm. and and really, you know, college courses. It's all changed in the last 20 years. Suddenly. You know, all the big schools have game development courses. They have, you know, obviously they've always had engineering courses, but you can go and learn about game design. You can go and learn about doing 3D graphics. So, you know, relative to, you know, artists these days seeking to get into game development, I actually think getting a really strong education is um, a, a really good route now, especially as the industry's grown and there's so much competition to get in to, to these companies mm-hmm. and the business aspect of it all is so unforgiving. The competition is just crazy. So it, it definitely helps to have kind of some training and some education behind you to just round out and really know what you're doing as you're, you know, submitting resumes to, you know, these, these, these companies. Um, but that really didn't exist um, when I was, you know, 18, 19. Um, you know, so I, I got I got very very lucky. So I, I, I my hope is that my story doesn't sound like I'm anti-education. Nothing could be further from the truth. But it was a very different world even just 20 years ago. Yeah, it's crazy how fast the time changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I actually relate to that story a lot too. I, I can't tell you how many times I hear from like my dad or aunts and uncles like, you you're really good at math. You should be an accountant. Like, right, I, I don't right, know. right, or a scientist, or you know, you know, yeah, the the predictable. Like, I, yeah, I, I don't want to go in to work every day dreading what I do for the rest yeah. of my life. Yeah, no, I get that. I hear that for sure. Um, okay, next question is, um, who or what would you say is the most challenging character, project, story you've worked on, and why? Interesting. Um, it's, it's funny, like the, the, the big characters pop, you know, like obviously, um, Thrall and Warcraft, while I would say what I'm really proud of with Thrall over time is, um, you know, after Warcraft 2, we're developing Warcraft 3, I really, I really wanted to approach, you know, I come from the world of Dungeons and Dragons, right, which really comes from the world of Tolkien, how funny that the Lord of the Rings movies popped over the last 10 years, and suddenly everybody knows what an elf and a dwarf is. Um, at the time that we were doing our games, you know, only us geeks did. And so I really wanted to show that, um, kind of break down the, the fantasy stereotypes and show that, like, even orcs could be very humane and have honor. And even humans, you know, the noble humans, you know, could act like assholes from time to time. And ultimately, you know, we're all kind of the same, you know, regardless of what you look like. It's kind of a sociological study, crude or not. Um, of the fact that you know we're all just we're all just people you know trying to do our best and so Thrall kind of epitomized to me um, a character that was supposed to be monstrous but ultimately you know was was had held deep conviction you know and um, really stood up and tried to be um, noble and have a vision for his people that was beyond what they believed of themselves and so I really get a kick looking back that you know we kind of put a dent in what fantasy is supposed to be in the mainstream. I mean, showed that, you know, kind of people are people. And strangely enough, Thrall was kind of, um, he's the kind of character that like, over the course of your life, you know, you know, I kind of went through a marriage and divorce and, you know, I kind of deep soul searching, you know, um, you know, just over my own experience. And so I think I used Thrall as a kind of a way to express you know, kind of some of my, you know, fears and doubts and life issues over time, um, particularly in the Cataclysm product we did a number of years ago for World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so I look back and I'm, I'm I, I I think Thrall had some really interesting moments and they, they made me feel like an artist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, um, I don't get to write, you know, beautiful songs for a living, but, you know, there were moments there with Thrall where I felt I, you know, kind of got to be a soulful artist. Mm-hmm. Um and, uh, you know, the character of Kerrigan in StarCraft, um, I tried to make her a very dimensional character. One is a villain, not a villain, you know, and just kind of this, this beat-up, lonely character um, and the, the choices she had to make over the arc of her career I'm very proud of. Um, and and Raynor, to some other degree, he's the, he's the hero in StarCraft. Um, between the two of them, I think I was um, – you know, really trying to express and communicate, you know, kind of just kind of a lot of, you know, my issues of just kind of, you know, I don't know, relating to people, loneliness, going through relationships and breakups. And um, so I look back very fondly on the two of those characters and, um, 
kind of culminating with the end of, uh, I don't know how hip you are in all these games or whatever, but um, we did a, an expansion for StarCraft II called Heart of the Swarm, um, okay. which at the end of that, it really culminated, uh, well, actually not not totally as of today. Um, the next the next product uh, definitely resolves the StarCraft storyline. But I really loved at the end of Heart of the Swarm how you know these two beat up people whose love for each other had, had affected their lives to such degree were actually able just to kind of let go of each other and just kind of recognize that they both had different paths where more classic love stories, you know, they, they, they get to go off and have the white picket fence and, you know, everything's all good. I kind of liked how Raider and Kerrigan you know, kind of had a different path, right? Their, their lives totally informed each other and ennobled each other, but they didn't have the predictable ending. Um, so I, I really liked that out of, uh, out of StarCraft, you know, kind of down the, the center of it was this really, um, I don't know, non-predictable love story. You know, I'm very proud of that. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I haven't gotten a chance to play Heart of the Swarm yet, but I, I, I pretty much played, you know, StarCraft to all – I've been playing World of Warcraft since 2005. <laughs> played, uh, right on. At Diablo 2 and 3. Um, Crazy. I, I have to say that Illidan is probably one of my favorite characters. Um, oh, hell yeah. He, you know, he's always trying to do the right thing, but he just always ends up getting the short end of the stick. And maybe totally. he's not wrong about things the right way, but, you know, he's a very cool I, character. I, I think ultimately he was just totally misunderstood. Um, so I would, uh, just for fun, I would I would keep your eyes peeled for, for more Illidan okay. as time goes by. Very cool. Let's see. Uh, what's One of my favorite things to do is to like send videos to my friends that I, I find like very inspirational or something that I would like to be able to do one day. What What's one of the greatest sources of inspiration that you found maybe in other people's work? Be it totally. A great game, movie. Totally. Um, you know, it's funny. I just sent, uh, you know, we're jamming and designing all the time here and we were talking through a specific story scene. Mm-hmm. And I always go back, and I, I actually found a bunch of pages online and sent it to you know my my team, going, oh yeah, check this out, yeah yeah yeah, this is this is this example of this scene we're talking about. And to me, the well I always go back to, and I've told this man this many many times, it's kind of funny, um, but uh, there's a gentleman named Walter Simonson, and he was a writer and an artist um, for Marvel Comics back in the 80s, um, and and you know he's still he's still doing badass stuff today, but. He really was most famous for his run on the Mighty Thor, you know, you know Thor from the you know Marvel movies or whatever. Um, but this guy wrote Thor um, for a number of years in the mid '80s, and just from start to finish, his run on this book was just so utterly badass. Like I, I had never seen anything like it. I love the way he drew. I love the the world that he kind of crafted. Um, he didn't make it all the ideas of. Obviously, the, the, the ideas in that comic had been around since the 60s, really, with, starting with Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. But Simonson just had a way of, of, of rendering that world and its characters and its themes in such a way that was just super epic. Um, and uh, it, it really it really impressed itself upon me as a kid. And it, it really made me want to write and draw and fuse it all together and be a storyteller. Um, so it's funny all these years later, um, kind of working on these big epic worlds. Um, to me, the the root of that in me, or or my passion that way, is, is has always been a big part of of, of that Thor run. Um, so I love sharing, you know, sequences or pages or kind of scenes that Walt rendered um, with the guys here. You know, they go, "What the hell is this?" It's, you know, kind of a blast from the '80s. I'm like, "No, no, no, it's timeless," you know. Um, so yeah, Simonson's Thor was always a, a biggie for me, um, and probably the same stuff as everybody else. You know, I'm a you know four alarm Star Wars fan. You know, I love uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I love almost all the worlds they built. Um, you know, in at TSR back in the '80s, um, were just utterly badass. Um, so those are those kind of remain um, my my primary sources of inspiration. You know, comics and D and D, but um, primarily Simonson Thor was was just. Uh, yeah, it was really good. Uh, one of my favorite uh, sources of inspiration from recent memory is a short film. Uh, actually, it's called Wanderers. Uh, Wanderers. Uh, it's made by a guy, I think his name is Eric uh, Reinquist or something along those lines. Um, it's He, he took um, uh, clips of Carl Sagan's uh, narration of The Pale Blue Dot. Huh. And he just he made these 
epic, stunning, like breathtaking visuals to go along with it. That they were supposed to visualize what we could one day achieve if we were to actually go out into space. Wow, I'm gonna check that out for sure. It's, it's definitely a very cool watch. But I love that. I love that kind of stuff. Cosmos. Mm-hmm. Um. Was there ever a point you had to work on projects that you couldn't get interested in at all? And if so, how did you deal with it? That's really good. Um, Let me think about that. I've never had to work on one that um, I didn't have some level of vested interest in. Um, I've been very fortunate to kind of be at the ground floor of a lot of these worlds as they got started. So, you know, seeing them evolve over time, seeing the storylines and the histories evolve over time has been, uh, like, super interesting to me. There have definitely been times where I've been less close to certain projects. Um, There have been times where I'm trying to do – I kind of work on everything at once. But that demands that, you know, sometimes you really got to pull back um, and you can't shape things with your hands like you would, you know, like you would want to do. And you kind of have to leave it to others to, you know, really breathe life into. And so it it can be very frustrating for me to have to stand back, you know, and let the let the captains run with the ball. Um, But, you know, yeah, not not, there hasn't been often that like we've we've had a game project that I, I wasn't pretty geeked up on. Um, the trick to me has been I've, I've had this hybrid career. I don't maybe start about 15 years ago. Um, is that um, I got promoted into a role where, you know, I was still doing a lot of kind of creative driving, but I was also um, made responsible for a lot of our creative departments. And so I kind of had to be, you know, I had to do kind of more administrative stuff, um, not business stuff as such, but, you know, like be the boss, be people's bosses and, and, and you know, have to be accountable for the strategy of the products and where we're going um, as part of our, you know, administrative team. And I will tell you, trying to do both um, or live in both worlds, bestride both worlds was was rough, you know, Um uh, you know, you know, I made it work, and you know, I've made some career choices over time where I've kind of stepped back away from the executive stuff. But um, trying to be two different creatures at once is uh, incredibly de-energizing <laughs> for me. Um, so, so I learned a lot of lessons that way over time, um, and kind of came back to the idea that um, the the thing I really am built for most is just more. Uh, you know, more the creative end of the streets. Um, you know, that that's definitely uh, been a challenge over the years is, is figuring out a way to, you know, kind of wear both hats um, and uh, be balanced, you know, as, as an officer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I have to say one of my greatest fears about getting into a field like this is just having to work on, like, you know, the next Barbie game or something <laughs> along the lines. You know, you know what's funny, though, man? It's It's... I totally get that, but with every, you know, with, with, with any assignment, right, and this is anything, this is any assignment, because even when it looks like, oh, man, I can work on, uh, you know, Halo 5 or, you know, just some badass, you know, thing, the, the fact is, for younger professionals or newer professionals getting into the mix, the tasks you're giving, even though you're working on just some, some completely badass thing, more often than not, down the stretch of any product's development, not every task is going to be the sexiest thing, and right. not every, you know what I mean, not every phase of development is the most inspiring. Like, you know, it can be long hours. It can be long, you know, especially we got into a, a, a rut with Blizzard where, I mean, it was taking us five or six years to get a game out. That is just that is just madness, right? Imagine taking that long to do one thing, ultimately. And, you know, you kind of get into the long, dark tea time of the soul where you're kind of going, what am I even doing? You know, like I I love the thing, the idea of the thing when it finally goes out. But, you know, um, even, you know, if if you got into the industry and your first gig is making the Barbie game, make a killer Barbie game, right? Investigate it. Read about it. You know, get, get geeked up about your audience and find creative ways to you know, just engage, like everyone's got to pay their dues. You know, I came up doing Lost Vikings and things. I didn't know anything about that. You know, I wanted to build big worlds, right? But 
everything is experience. Um, and when you apply who you are and, and, and your passion to things that even don't necessarily geek you up all that much, it's still invaluable experience. It's still an invaluable foot in the door. Um, and any assignment can be approached creatively, right? Because um, you never know who you might geek up and um, – Heaven forbid girls get badass content too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. These days and someone finds a way to do a barbie game that's actually awesome, you know, and cuts over sure. across the lines. I don't know. Um, I've never done one, honestly, so it's easy to talk, but um, it, it is an interesting point, right? Everyone's got to start somewhere and, um, you know, just giving everything you have in front of you your your utmost um, is really important, you know, because – Here's the other thing, too. There's 10,000 kids that want that Barbie game because it's, it's at least a step into the industry, you know. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty crazy out there. Yeah, fair enough. Typically, how hectic would you say it is working in the field versus how hectic it is when a game is nearing release? Like the hours and... Yeah. Uh, it, it can depend. Um, usually, things are more intense the closer you get to ship, um, usually, um, which isn't to say there can't be, you know, like, like on, on any track of development, you're going to have different gates and milestones, you know, along the length of the development. Um, obviously, shipping is the last great gate. So with any kind of milestone coming up, you know, there's usually, um, you know, po the possibility of like crunch time or things like that to get everything lined up to meet your dates. Um, but yeah, usually it's 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 worse at the end. Um, and just by virtue of depending on how long the development process has been. And again, I just said like ours. You know, for a while there, it was looking pretty rough. You know, I, I think we've been working on StarCraft two in one manner or another for like ten years. You know, um, that's just that's just batshit crazy. So, you know, down the stretch of things, um, as you get closer to finish, not only is it intense, and you gotta you gotta get everything done and get it on the disc and get everything you know play tested and you know, but you're doing all of that at your at your most maximum exhaustion level. Because you've literally just been doing it forever, you know. So, you know, it's it's kind of where the 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 tough get going, you know. And um, you got to be kind of mentally tough to, you know, keep it keep it together down the long stretch. You know, it's it's kind of you know, like runners have the same kind of thing as the last half mile. That's just where you gotta you have to buck up even even more. Um, so yeah, it can it can definitely be um, definitely be intense. There's a different kind of intensity, I think, when you start because it's just this mad kind of crazy clash of ideas and you're shaping the thing you want to build and it's kind of a different level of um you know the the, the different level of burning calories against an idea as opposed to just working hard mm -hmm. to achieve it so you know there's definitely distinct life cycles you know throughout a project and you kind of burn energy in different ways in different phases um does any of this make any sense yeah it's kind of, it's kind of like uh all right, guys, we got to decide a direction to go with this and, you know, finally start going. Yeah. So it's kind of a mad dash even at the start. And then you're like, okay, this is it. Let's let's start making smart decisions and build it, you know, and get a plan together. And that's kind of a different, you know, level of kind of energy and, and focus, you know. So it, it definitely changes over the over the arc of the development, you know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you had to choose one defining moment in your career to tell me about, what would it be? Interesting. Interesting. You know, I'll tell you, it's kind of a funny thing. Like 20 years in, right, just a lot of experience and a lot of water under the bridge. Um, as a younger man, I was absolutely driven to kind of to be creative, to show the world what I can do. Uh, I don't know, to make my father proud, to, you know, to, to – actualize as a person if i perform well and if the things i work on are are loved and lauded by people well then maybe you know maybe i'm okay you know maybe i have some self-worth i know that that dives a little deep but as i look back like that's totally you know um you know it wasn't a rock band it wasn't about getting girls or anything it was like i was particularly working out my life issues and if if i could just perform at a high level and, and rock you know and put out things that people love then you know, I could feel secure in my own skin and life would be okay. And it's funny, all these years later, um, as a result um, of just being, you know, in, in this house and being part of Blizzard and the amazing, amazing 
luck we've had over time. You know, it's, it's, it's not just luck, but we've been very fortunate, blessed even to have had all these, you know, big games, you know, all these hits, you know, it's, it's totally illogical that this has all occurred. But looking back at all of that, um, it's funny, my perspective now is much more about, um, it's just shifted. It's, it's, I think it's important to always be part of things that we're passionate about and building really things of high quality. Like that's what matters most is when the, the love you're putting into the craftsmanship translates to people, you know, that are ultimately playing it. That's everything, regardless of what kind of game it is, regardless of what system it's on, regardless of whether it's fantasy or science fiction or what, whatever else, other else it might be. It's that ultimately you're building things out from, from the base of your passion. And you're as excited about the thing at the end as you were at the beginning. And you know you can put something into the world that you can be very proud of. And with any luck, others are very proud to be part of it as well. That's, that's the kind of core, I think, of, of who we are at Blizzard. But I find this other thing happening, too, in my ripe old age. I'm, what am I? I'll, I'll be 42 this year. Old man, right? Um, but I find this other thing happening, too, where it's as much about the craftsmanship and, and the, the, the ideas I want to spin into the world as it is about the people around me. And how can we maintain quality, right, and do really great shit, but also be building a culture, right, that is creative and supportive and, and, and safe and enriching. Um, Cause a lot of times, you know, this happens to a lot of companies when you push so hard for quality, right. And artistry and go, 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 you know, we got to build the biggest thing in the world, right. And get millions of people to come into the pool and have a, have a pool party. Um, that's all well and good, but it's incredibly difficult. And the, the tendency for big companies that are pushing that hard is that you can kind of lose people. You can kind of lose your connectivity to what makes you successful in the first place. And people can get lost in the mix and people can be burned out and people can feel um, kind of in the big grind to get the thing done, whatever the thing is, you know, people can start to feel unappreciated. Um, and when um, people start to kind of lose their connection um, to, to why you're even doing it, right? When they don't feel part of the culture or part of the tribe, your passion just winks out. You know, like nothing, nothing steals your passion and your energy more than feeling disconnected. Um, and when that starts to happen, uh, your culture is gone. And it's so hard to get it back because it's, it's really being creative with other, being creative by yourself is one thing, right? You know, George Martin sits and he jams on, you know, the, the, you know, the, the Game of Thrones books and, you know, you can sit in your house and be creative. You can paint, you can write a song, you can play guitar, you can do whatever you're doing. Um, and you do it as much for yourself as, as for any reaction you might get out of other people. And it's really just your life energy and your time and your commitment and your discipline that's involved. Infinitely more difficult when you're doing that with like a hundred other people. You know what I mean? It's, it's so much harder to be creative and be an artist corporately. And I don't mean corporate like company. I mean like uh, amongst other people that are – just like you and having to communicate and work out your differences and work out your life shit, you know, going on as you're trying to be creative and making smart, you know, strategic calls and, the, and fighting really just for creativity, you know, like what should this character be like? What should this line of dialogue be? How should this music sound? And finding a way to do that as a group um, is incredibly difficult. You know, it doesn't come easy learning how to communicate and how to give and take and how to be a healthy part of a driving culture um, is not easy. Um, you know, especially when you get into it young, you know, you know, like I was, a, I was a total knucklehead at 19, you know, I didn't know how to compromise or how I was just had a, had a, had a mission. You know, I had this religious crusade, right. To build big ideas. Um, and now I understand that, the way people relate and the way your culture takes shape and how it holds together is so important, right? It, it is as important as the big genius idea you might have that people might like, because if you can't hold together as a group and if you can't hold together as a team, it doesn't matter how good your idea was. It doesn't matter how good your business plan was. It doesn't matter how many subscriptions you might get for your big MMORPG. None of it will happen if you can't hold together as a group of people. 
Um, so, so that's kind of the interesting turn as I look back. More than any piece of technology or any great game, and I'm proud of it all, um, it was really our company really taking a moment to step back and re-engage um, with this truth, you know, that um, people are the infinitely most important asset of any great company. Um, and, you know, as I look at being an officer in this place these days, um, that really informs a lot of um, how I look at things, you know, that the, the ideas we should chase and the projects we should build um, is as much about the people we have and how passionate they are and how passionate they are about working with each other to achieve it. Does any of all that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so that was an amazing answer. Yeah. Um, so the final question that I have is, um, it may or may not have been just answered, but uh, if you could think of anything else for this, then, you know, feel free. Um, what would you say the greatest piece of advice you can think of for someone who is just starting out in this type of field, you know, maybe somebody that wants to work in the real estate as well? Um, in, in a weird way, it's it's kind of the last topic, but to personalize it more, it's kind of um, it's kind of a challenge, right? Like I think about the knucklehead kid I was when I got hired, um, and I think about a lot of people that might be in school right now or, or kind of getting training, you know, either through technology or, or game design or just learning art, um, and they want to be part of the industry. Um, the best piece of us, piece of advice I, I could have, um, and I haven't thought this through, but off the top of my head, it's really try and know yourself um, if you want to be a writer. Well, what kind of writer do you want to be? And what are the kind of things you want to write? If you want to be an artist, well, what kind of artist? You know, like, what does it mean to you? What do you really want to do and really want to be? Um, the more you kind of understand yourself and where your passions come from, um, and, and, you know, to, to the best of your ability, you know, extrapolating what you want to do with your time in your life, um, that self-knowledge is critical because that's going to frame, let, let's say you got a job, you know, amidst all the competition and you land at a shop that has, you know, potential or, or, or you land at, you know, I don't know, Mattel and you're doing Barbie games. The more you understand yourself and what you're about, um, and, and really get a hold of your, your your capacity to engage with people in the pursuit of the thing. Um, are you capable of teamwork? What does it mean to be professional? Um, you know, how is your how are your communication skills? How is your empathy for people? Um, can can you jam and give and take and, and kind of move um, in a space where you know it might not always be easy and you might not always want to do what the boss wants or you might not always be totally geeked up about the tasks you have in front of you? The more you're aware of yourself and what really drives you and and, and motivates you, you're going to be able to navigate those spaces, um, you know, much more effectively. Um, I think a lot of people look at the industry and go, oh, hey, fuck, video games, that'd be amazing. I could be creative and, like, it's all rainbows or whatever. And, again, it ain't it ain't curing cancer, right? It is it is making video games, which should be inherently fun. But the, the hard, fast reality is um, – with a lot of companies, especially small companies that are starting, it can get not fun really fast because it is a lot of work and it can be a lot of hours and you have to have total dedication because the competition is so high. And, and again, the way you navigate those spaces is really based as much on your ability just to, to, to be in rhythm with other people as it is your innate talent or the specificity of your training, all of those things are important. Um, but if you can't work well with other people in a fast-moving, demanding environment, it, it almost doesn't matter how talented you are. It almost doesn't matter how great your training was. Um, the, the truth of it all, the truth of success is found in how you relate to other people. Um, that, like that's the, that's the hard, cold fact of it all, you know.